This is the third presentation in a series of four on human evolution. It covers the period from 10,000 years ago, the dawn of agriculture, up to 1,000 years ago. The first presentation covered the period up to the split between humans and our ape cousins, 7 million years ago, and the second covered human progress up to the age of agriculture. This one covers a period from the advent of agriculture up through the past millennium, the time at which Western civilization spread to dominate the earth. The key point is that evolution has been accelerating over the entire history of life on earth. Factors that speeded it up include sexual reproduction, the move from ocean onto land, competition with other species, and especially a species' ability to change its own environment. Human beings have always been masters at changing our environment. The rate at which we did so increased dramatically with agriculture. The traits that determine human reproductive success changed with the environment. Agriculture and other changes spurred by it has profoundly affected the traits that lead to our reproductive success. This video will briefly recap the changes that have been brought about since the advent of civilization. Human nature changed profoundly, but those changes did not affect all human populations uniformly. Some came to agriculture later than others, and some had no exposure to it whatsoever until Western Europe's age of exploration, starting four centuries ago. Thus, some, in, some human populations reflect the outcome of 10 millennia of intense natural selection brought on by agriculture and civilization, and others do not. The unsurprising but politically awkward result is that they are markedly different in almost every measurable way. Bone deep, not just skin deep, as some would like to pretend. Let's recap where the world was 10,000 years ago, just warming up coming out of the Younger Dryas Ice Age. Human beings had spread to every habitable part of the Earth. We had driven a lot of large animal species, our sources of protein, to extinction. Over significant chunks of our habitat, the human population of 5 million or so had expanded up to carrying capacity. If children were to prosper, they needed to take land from each other or figure out some better way to make use of the land they had. That better way was agriculture. The beginning of agriculture was generally placed in the Fertile Crescent, stretching from the Lower Nile River to Mesopotamia, that name meaning the area between two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. The soil was fertile, watered by annual floods and amenable to the domestication of plants already growing in those areas. The small dark green spots in this movie show the spread of agriculture over its first two millennia. Before the first stories of the Bible came to be told, agriculture had spread fairly widely throughout the Middle East. It started independently in China a couple of millennia later. Agriculture easily spread east and west. There were fairly contiguous patches of arable land where the same crops would grow and the same animals could be pastured, stretching across Eurasia. There's a lively debate about the extent to which it spread by other people copying what the agriculturalists were doing and where the agriculturalists displaced hunting and gathering peoples. DNA evidence seems to favor copying. Within the first few millennia, agriculture had spread from North Africa through India and Southeast Asia up the Chinese coast toward Japan and Korea. Agriculture got a later start in the Americas. People had not arrived across the Bering Strait until 15,000 years ago. The initial population was small and there were lots of large animals to be eaten. The Americas have a general north-south geographical orientation. The tropics stood in the way of the exchange of ideas between temperate regions. Agriculture seems to have sprung up independently in Peru and Mexico. The lands connecting those two points of origin define the civilizations of the Maya, Inca, Aztecs, and their precursors. Although Indians elsewhere in the Americas were growing crops of some sort at the time the Europeans arrived, their so-called Indian gardens tended to be seasonal affairs planted and harvested by the still nomadic Indians. 
Much of North and South America, like Australia and Sub-Saharan Africa, remained without any agricultural civilization. The human population had grown significantly and undergone a great deal of evolutionary pressure in the 50 millennia since leaving Africa. The rate of progress had accelerated rapidly. The groups that had experienced the most pressure, primarily by moving to cold climates, had made the most evolutionary progress. Circumstances had forced them to develop sewing and weaving to make clothes, houses to stay warm, and to adopt more cooperative, less contentious social orders. Let's recap where mankind stood at the dawn of agriculture 10,000 years ago with regard to our technology, travel, communications, inventions and materials, warfare, trade, urbanization, intellectual advances, and religion. People were well familiar with how plants reproduced. They knew which plants were useful, and they were in the habit of throwing seeds where it would be convenient to find food later on. Dogs had been domesticated a few millennia previously. They were useful in hunting and would turn out to be useful as well in herding animals. Our technology had advanced quite a bit over the time since some branches of Homo sapiens had migrated out of Africa. We had invented fish hooks made from bones. We had learned how to tie our sharpened rocks and bones onto sticks, making hand axes and harpoons. We had learned how to make boats. Ancestors of the Australian Aborigines and Polynesian peoples had crossed stretches of open ocean. Nordic people used boats to hunt reindeer, fast on land, but sitting ducks when they're swimming. We learned how to fight with spears and bows and arrows. We learned how to trade between tribes of people. Obsidian, native glass, comes from volcanoes. It's only found in certain regions. It makes excellent arrowheads, which have been found a long way from the sources of obsidian. It has to have been by trade. There is strength in numbers. Kin groups had grown into tribes and nations. We needed to keep track of stuff. People had started using tally sticks, maybe not as pretty as the one in this picture, with notches to represent the size of a debt. We started to be superstitious, to believe in things beyond our immediate experience. This picture of a fertility goddess is from 25 millennia back. People knew they were mortal. They had funeral rites. They believed in the immortality of their tribe. They appear to have believed that magic could give them a successful hunt. Choosing pigs as a starting point for a history of agriculture is quite arbitrary. After tumming dogs for protection and hunting, humans tamed a number of herbivore species useful for food, fur, and milk, bit by bit over several millennia. As humans migrated out of the tropics into zones with well-defined seasons, saving food for winter became more and more important. Drying food was one of their more significant innovations. Crops were domesticated from wild plants people had grown accustomed to eating. What they call the eight founder crops of the Fertile Crescent all appear about the same time in the archaeological record. The grains include barley and two types of wheat. Legumes include lentils, peas, chickpeas, and vetch. The last, flax, is useful for both oil and fiber. Agriculture presented men with the delightful problem of having enough food that they could store some for future consumption. They invented granaries to keep their grain dry. They made friends with cats to keep the mice down. The fish hook had been around for a long time prior to agriculture. The fish net was even more productive. The same woven fibers in the form of string and rope were useful in making traps and snares to catch animals. Agricultural civilizations appear to have sprung up independently in China based on millet, rice, and soy. The adoption of bananas and other fruits in the tropical world changed human culture, but did not lead to societies based on agriculture. While men had long ago invented boats, it was not until they learned how to work with textiles that they could fashion sails to use the wind to move them. The innovations just named caused men to specialize in certain tasks. They developed professions. Some became good at farming, others at herding, others at curing animal hides, and others at storing grain, and some became good at sailing boats. Unlike tribal people, they were no longer jacks of all trades. 
people of different callings gathered together into towns for both economic reasons and mutual defense. People of towns required a major change in mentality. Primitive men like apes tended to hold the size of the tribe down to 150 or so, the Dunbar number of individuals a single person can know by personality. You could not know everybody in a town of 5,000. It took significant evolutionary adaptation to learn how to interact successfully with strangers, to take advantage of their talents while not letting them take advantage of your naivete. Long distance trade also involved dealing with strangers. The stone adze blades shown in this picture were crafted in the mountains upstream along the Danube and traded to the farmers downstream. Picture the skills required, language, navigation, knowing the relative value of products being exchanged, and certainly how to fight off bandits. The flat lands of the Fertile Crescent did not offer much in the way of lumber or rock for building. They used what they had, dirt and straw, to make bricks. These improved over time. The world's first great cities were built of brick. People in the Americas had been eating wild forms of corn and potatoes for millennia prior to the time they became dependent on them as a primary food source. The American Indian civilizations emerged only three or four millennia ago. The primary domestic herbivore they used for food was the guinea pig, hardly comparable to the cow, sheep, or pig of the Eurasian continent. American civilizations were highly communal. Property and food appear to have been held in common. Trade was therefore among villages and nations, not individuals. This twist of evolution was to leave the Native Americans singularly unsuited for participation in the highly individualistic European-style civilization. This is evident even today in the sad condition of reservation Indians from Hudson's Bay in Canada south to Chile. Donkeys came into use for long-distance trade in Africa and the Middle East. They appear to have been freely bought and sold and spread widely. Contrast this with the only American beast of burden, the llama. Llamas live only in the Andes Mountains. Moreover, the Inca nation carefully controlled llama breeding and trade. The paucity of navigable rivers, beasts of burden, and ocean-going watercraft in the Americas significantly hindered the spread of ideas. Innovations from Europe could not cross the Atlantic. Similarly, the Sahara Desert impeded the spread in Africa, which developed no agricultural civilization. While early man knew about metals, they existed as a mere curiosity. There were no useful amounts of anything other than gold or silver, to be found as native metals. Then came copper smelting, probably an accidental discovery associated with baking bricks or pottery. It led to innovations in transportation, architecture, and warfare. Tin was discovered not long thereafter. After a few centuries experimentation, it was found that bronze, a tin to one mixture of the two, was ideal for making weapons. Whereas copper is widespread, tin occurs only in a few places there was soon a lively long-distance trade in metal ingots. It appears that potters used simple wheels for a millennium or so before somebody figured out how to fix them to an axle and use them for transportation. No doubt the availability of metal made it easier to craft a working wheel and axle. Not coincidentally, money and accounting appear to have been invented about the same time, depending, of course, on one's definition. Certainly, the emergence of new goods for long-distance trade created a need for both money and accounting. Not that men need an excuse to go to war, but the wealth that could be accumulated through agriculture and trade obviously presented a tempting target. Bronze swords were put to use, followed by shields, war horses, and fortresses. Ur, the world's first city with an estimated population of 60,000, is a testament to the agricultural richness of the Fertile Crescent. It witnesses the development of transportation adequate to provision such a large population and the advantages proceeding from the specialization of professions among them. The Bible tells us that Abraham, the patriarch of the Jews, was born in Ur. Horses and oxen, originally domesticated for food and transportation, were obviously stronger than men. 
Even before the invention of the plow, people learned to use them to haul heavy loads. The invention of the wheel speeded the process up. Our Eurasian ancestors had to evolve to manage the changes they were making to their physical, social, and work environments. Oral accounts of life in these times were passed down in the first books of the Bible. The Mediterranean, Black, and Red Seas are protected enough to navigate and bounded by agriculturally productive lands. From the days of the Fertile Crescent, they provided avenues for the exchange of goods and ideas. The Phoenicians became master sailors, using both sailing and oared vessels. Iron must be smelted at temperatures higher than are required for copper. Discovering that the addition of carbon was necessary to make it truly useful took a while. The resulting steel, both harder and more abundant than bronze, had an even greater impact on technology. Slavery became strongly institutionalized as societies grew. Richer societies had more use for a working underclass and better means to hold them in captivity. Writing evolved in a series of small steps, starting with pictures and tallies, then evolving into a vehicle for communicating ideas. Cuneiform tablets in Mesopotamia were used for accounting records and to chronicle political activity. The plow and the use of draft animals brought more land under cultivation and made it more productive. The abacus facilitated trade by making arithmetic faster and more accurate. Invented in China, it was widely used long before Arabic numerals. There were no algorithms for doing arithmetic using cuneiform, but people could derive the sums on an abacus and write them down. The Jews, Zoroastrians, and others came to believe in one God. They believed that God laid down rules for human conduct enforced by both rewards and sanctions. Religious principles encouraged people to work together in larger social organizations. It promoted evolutionarily advantageous beliefs, such as the belief in having children and raising them to embrace the same religion. Akkad of Sargon is credited with creating the first empire in Mesopotamia, about eight millennia after the dawn of agriculture. To do so, he needed large armies, the means to feed them, money to arm them, and communications to control them. It took people with a vast number of different skills to run an empire. The richest, smartest, and hence the ones whose children would drive evolution were no longer the agriculturalists, but the city people. As written records became more commonplace, parchment made out of animal skins and papyrus came into widespread use. The level of violence in society decreased with increasing levels of civilization. Human and animal sacrifice diminished. Christ's message of brotherly love and a benevolent God was suited for a more peaceful world. The size of political entities in which a relative peace prevailed grew, the biggest being the Roman Empire, where Pax Romana prevailed. Reading and writing became commonplace. The works of Roman authors are still with us today. China and Japan were usually politically unified. Power tended to be held by mandarins selected for their intellectual ability. On the other hand, ideologies drove the dominant powers in the West. The Christians and Muslims each believed they were serving an all-powerful God. The altruistic Vikings believed in their culture and their people. The individual subordinated himself to the larger interests of his tribe and people. Vikings were fearsome warriors dominating lands as far away as Ukraine. The Christian world fell into separate kingdoms after the fall of the Roman Empire. Despite Jesus' message of peace, they continually fought one another, making warfare increasingly deadly through the inventions of the stirrup, the longbow, and other things. Accelerated evolution is most visible in the plants and animals we use for food. Few even remotely resemble their wild ancestors. Consider also the huge differences among dogs, all descendants of the wolf. The physical differences among people that have emerged since agriculture, blue eyes and lactose tolerance, for example, are remarkable enough. More remarkable is the softening of our temperament, making it possible to live in large communities of strangers. We became used to steady hard work 
not the episodic exertions of hunter-gatherers. We learn to control our impulses and to plan for the future. Perhaps the greatest evolutionary change has been the development of a level of intelligence sufficient to grapple with the environment we have created. Intelligence is a major factor in selecting a mate among people like the Jews and Parsis who specialize in intellectually demanding work, like trade and finance. Throughout the age of agriculture, the major force behind human evolution seems to have been evolution itself, technologies that allowed the most capable members of society to prosper and raise large families. The theme of continually improving intelligence and temperament persisted well into the last millennium. Evolution, however, is a blind process. Starting with the Enlightenment, philosophies and technologies emerge that appear to have been in the process of reversing these trends. This has resulted in a lot of hand-wringing concern for the future of humanity, most of it cast in moral terms. The next video will apply an evolutionary analysis to the same observed phenomena. The conclusion is that attempting to steer evolution to preserve what has been is probably a futile effort. However, we as humans do have the agency to control our own evolution to some degree. All we have is the freedom to choose our mates in a promising environment in which to raise our children. Let's take it.